Hey, Jeff Gibbons here with another video, and in this one, I'm going to be going over the very basics of synthesis. Now, I know there's lots of videos out there on synthesis already. I just want to have this basic video at the beginning because I'm hoping to do future videos where I get into certain software synthesizers or hardware synthesizers, and I want the basics for people to be able to refer back to in my video playlist. So hopefully you find this useful. I'll show you what I've got here. I've got a Juno 6, so this is going to be one of our synthesizers we'll look at. I've got the Korg Mini Log. And then I've got a bunch of software synthesizers as well. So we've got Serum, I've pulled up the old Subtractor, one of the very first synthesizers in Reason. I've got Massive X, and I've got Omnisphere. So when we're talking about synthesis, we need to understand a few things about sound, because that's all these synthesizers are doing is generating sounds. So we can break it down to three different properties. We've got pitch or frequency, loudness or amplitude, and timbre or tone. So the first one, pitch, refers to the fundamental frequency. So when you play a note, what is the note that you hear, the main note that you hear? You may hear other frequencies above that, but there's going to be one that's the strongest. What is that fundamental frequency? The next thing is loudness or amplitude, so that's just volume. Right, so when we talk about volume with a synthesizer, we have different ways of changing it. We can set the, the master volume of the synth, but then we can also change how things get louder over time. And we're going to use something called an envelope to do that. So that is loudness, and we've also got tone. And tone or timbre is the strength of other frequencies that are happening every time you play a note. And the thing that you need to understand about sound is that when I play a note, when I play one note, you're hearing the fundamental frequency, but for almost all sounds, we're hearing that fundamental frequency plus a whole bunch of other notes that are happening above that. And that's called the harmonic content, or the overtones, or the partials. And every sound creates overtones, it's except for one. There's one sound or one sound that we can generate that doesn't, and that is a sine wave. I'll be showing you this EQ window in Cubase, and it goes from low frequencies up to high frequencies. What we'll see is if we change it from something other than a sine wave, we'll see the fundamental frequency, and then we'll see these other frequencies that are popping up, and those are the overtones. So watch what happens if I change this from a sine wave to a triangle wave. We see a whole bunch of other little frequencies that are popping up. If we change this to a square wave, we get stronger harmonics. And if I change it to a saw wave, we actually get extra harmonics. Now that we understand the basics of sound, let's look at some basic components of most synthesizers. So this is going to be hardware synthesizers, software synthesizers, even samplers are going to have some or most of these controls. So the five ones that you really need to get your brain around are the oscillator, the amplifier, the filter, the envelope or envelope generator, and an LFO. So let's start with the oscillator. So the oscillator is the thing that makes the sound on the synthesizer. And when we look at old synthesizers, like this Juno, and analog synthesizers, like the new-ish Minilog, we're going to find that these devices create a tone using an oscillator. And what does the oscillator do? All an oscillator does is creates an electric signal. That's all it's doing. It's creating electricity. And that electricity is alternating, or AC. And it's the same sort of thing that would run down a microphone cable if you were to sing into a microphone. That microphone would convert your sound, your voice, into fluctuations on the diaphragm of the microphone, creating an alternating current running down the cable, which then needs to be amplified in a preamp. But with synthesizers, it's spitting out that electricity and it's creating that same kind of fluctuation. If you were to use a sawtooth wave, like we have here on this Juno, all the oscillator is going to do is create an electric signal that ramps up and drops down immediately, or almost, almost immediately, and then ramps up again and drops down, ramps up and drops down. So it's creating this wave that's going up really quickly and dropping immediately. And that's going to happen extremely fast, so fast that we can generate frequencies up to 20,000 hertz or 20,000 of these little ramps that go up and down. I wouldn't be able to hear that because my hearing is going, but 
Maybe young people could hear that. Anyways, so we've got these tones that are created, which is just electricity. That electricity goes to a speaker in its most basic form. We go to a speaker and cause the speaker to push out a little bit slowly and then drop back as fast as it could. Push out, drop back. And it's going to do that thousands of times per second. That's how it creates a tone. It's electricity. So once you have an idea about that, you can look at the oscillator section. You can sort of get an idea of how these old devices used to work. And you'll see on some synthesizers, they say DCO. And then on others, they say VCO. So the Korg Minilog is a voltage controlled oscillator. And the Juno is a digitally controlled oscillator. And you might be looking at the Juno thinking, I thought this was an analog synthesizer. And it still is. But this component is digitally controlled. And the reason was they could put these digital components in this old technology, very basic digital technology, that could control the oscillation that is happening and make sure that it's consistent. And in voltage controlled oscillators, which were a little bit older, they would be more prone to go out of tune. And so even this synthesizer, the new Korg Minilog, but the problem with this voltage controlled oscillator is that it can slip out of tune. So you might often have to reset the tuning on the Korg Minilog. So now we need to talk about the different types of waveforms. And a waveform is just how the oscillator is moving back and forth. The four basic waveforms that you need to know about are the sine wave, the triangle wave, the square wave, and the sawtooth or the saw wave. The sine wave, which is a wave that goes smoothly up to the top and smoothly down to the bottom, and it's kind of a logarithmic journey as opposed to straight up linear, which would be a triangle wave. So smooth up, smooth down. And if I go to reason, it's that pure tone that has no overtones. So that's that sound that you used to fall asleep in the middle of the night, you wake up and those color bars are on the TV and that tone is playing, that's a sine wave. And no harmonics at all, very, there's no richness in the sound at all. It's just the fundamental frequency and that's it. It's kind of the basic building block of sound. That's the sine wave. We've got the triangle wave, angle up to the top and then equal angle down to the bottom. And the triangle is great for lead sounds, things like that. Let's look at the harmonics we're generating when we play these different tones. So here is the sine wave, pure tone, no harmonics. And here is the triangle. If I use it in reason, we can see all of these harmonics that pop up. So it's very easy to see with this EQ window, the strength of those harmonics over top of the fundamental. The fundamental is always the bottom one, the biggest one, unless you've got a bunch of low frequency rumble in your synthesizer. So let's look at the next one. We've got a square wave. Go to reason. I've got the square wave right there. Square wave has more harmonic strength than the triangle. And if we look at the harmonics, they're very similar, just louder in the, the square wave. There we go. So that is the square wave. It is kind of a hollow sound and uh, often used for reed instruments. There's also something special about the square wave in the sense that you can use something called pulse width modulation. So a square wave can also be called a pulse or a pulse wave. And with the square wave or a pulse wave, what you can do is instead of having a perfect up and down cycle that we have with a square wave, what you can do is alter it so that maybe the up is shorter than the down and the down is longer. We've got a square wave and watch as I adjust the pulse width modulation. And then I can do the same thing over in Serum if I am on the square wave. And watch what happens when I start playing with the pulse width modulation on this wave. So if I go to make sure this one is set to PWM, by the way. That is going to get me that wider, that same sound that I was getting here. 
So that's what's happening with the square wave. Square wave is a special one where you can change the shape of the square with something called pulse width modulation. Another very common waveform is the sawtooth wave, which I talked about at the beginning. Sawtooth wave goes on an angle up and then drops straight down. Angle up, straight down. And with a sawtooth wave, because of the shape, you get a lot more harmonics. You get this rich sound that can be very aggressive but can also be much more drastic when you use a filter on it to get rid of some of those frequencies maybe uh, with a control so we're going to use something called modulators to do that in a little bit there's a sawtooth wave in reason and if i look at the harmonics we can see very very rich in harmonics and it actually adds extra harmonics to the sound so if I look at it and go from a sawtooth back to a triangle or a square, we can see a whole bunch of harmonics drop out. Back to the saw, back to the square, and then onto the triangle. So those are the basic waveforms, four basic waveforms, all generated by the oscillator. And the other thing, of course, that you can do with an oscillator is change the pitch. Some of them, some of these synthesizers have two oscillators. So for example, with the Korg Minilog, I could play this note and I could turn on, turn on a second oscillator and put it to a totally different wave shape. I can then also go to the oscillator section here and change the pitch of one of them. Let's go look at Omnisphere as well for some of these controls. So there is Omnisphere and in Omnisphere all I've done is gone to the first layer or A and gone to the oscillator and chosen synth. Not a sample but a synth and in here if you choose saw square fat you're going to get a saw wave, a square wave and then we've also got triangle and sine wave as well. So the next control that we've got on our synthesizer that we need to get our brains around is the filter. And the filter is kind of related to the oscillator and the frequencies it's generating because what a filter does is it removes frequencies. So it's just like it sounds. It actually gets rid of some of the frequencies that your oscillator is generating. And this is what we actually call subtractive synthesis. So when you hear subtractive synthesis, that's what they're referring to. A synth that generates tones and has a filter that can reduce the strength of those harmonics. Where is the filter section on each of these synthesizers? You can see something that says VCF on the Juno, which is voltage controlled filter. On the Korg, we've got just the filter section with a couple of knobs and we've got filters in the software. So let's, let's look at Serum and how a filter works in Serum. I'm just going to turn this basic filter on and what it is is called a low pass filter. That is the most common type of filter. That's the kind of filter that we have right here. This in this VCF section, low pass filter, same thing that we've got right here. And I can go over to Serum and I can turn that filter on and if I raise the cutoff all the way up, we're going to see a little visual of how frequencies are being cut. This is low frequencies all the way up to high frequencies. As I drag this cutoff down, we're going to be reducing more and more of the high frequency overtones of the note. So here is, there's the note right there. We can see all the overtones. Let's see what happens as I drag the cutoff down. We're almost at a sine wave. So almost every synthesizer has this low pass filter. And the more you crank down the cutoff, the more of those high frequency overtones you're going to reduce. But remember, it's the overtones that we're changing here. Of course, you can sweep it far down enough that you get to the fundamental, but it's changing the overtones. That's what the frequency control is doing. The other control you need to know about on all filters is that there's something called resonance. The resonance is an interesting one because what it does is at the point where, you, where the drop is happening, if we look over in Serum, so as, at the point where the frequencies start getting cut off, we can crank up the resonance. It's gonna create a little boost right before the drop off. So it'd be the same thing as going to an EQ window in your digital audio workstation, putting on a filter, like a low pass filter, and going like this, reducing the frequencies, 
but then it would also be like having another little EQ boost right before the drop-off. So the more you crank up the resonance, the more you're going to get of this boost right be at that cutoff point. And it just makes the sound a little bit more interesting. Later on, we'll have a way to modulate that resonance and you get some really interesting effects when you do that as well. So let's look on the Juno. Start filtering some frequencies. And then let's adjust the resonance. And watch what happens if I leave the resonance up and play with the frequency. Now we get some really interesting sounds. That's where you get your wub wub sound. Right? And again, later we'll figure out how to modulate this so I could do that exact action with the actual hardware itself, even on this old device. With the Korg, I'm going to set it to a saw wave. If, if the resonance knob is all the way off, as I turn down the cutoff, but if I crank up the resonance, We can do that in every other instrument here. So we've got a filter in Reason and play a tone and adjust the filter, play with the resonance, right? So all of these synthesizers have frequency or cutoff and resonance controls. Okay, so that is the filter. Find the filter on the synthesizer that you're working on figure out how to adjust the cutoff and the resonance, and you'll get an idea of what's happening when you remove those harmonics or those other frequencies. Other things to know about filters are there are different types of filters. So it's not just a low pass filter that cuts the high frequencies. You also have something called a high pass filter. And that's going to cut low frequencies. High pass filter allows the high frequencies to pass. The more you crank it up, the more of the low frequencies you cut. And of course, if you're cutting the low frequencies, you're cutting the fundamental and you're kind of leaving yourself with the overtones. And if we go over to something like Serum, I can see I've got a filter right here and right now it's set to a low pass filter. What if we send this to, set this to a band pass filter? Now, if I go to Serum and if I play with the cutoff, we get this very nasally sound and as you sweep the cutoff, it's choosing the point where the bandpass is allowing frequencies to be. So as you sweep through it, you get really interesting effects as well. The next thing we've got is the amplifier section. And over here on the Juno, we've got the amplifier section right here. We can see VCA, voltage controlled amplifier. And in the Korg, we've got this little amplitude envelope or envelope generator. And then over in the other synths, we have the same sort of thing. In Serum, the very first envelope is the amplitude envelope for the synth that you're working on. So what is the envelope? The envelope refers to how sound gets louder over time. So this is a very time-based thing in the sense that when you play a key on the keyboard, when you press the note, how fast does the sound go to full volume? You could set the control so that volume goes up at a slow pace, maybe like a string sound, or you could have it with a very fast pace so that the sound comes in instantly like a percussive sound. So the controls we have for the envelope are the attack, decay, sustain, and the release. So the attack is how quickly does the sound come in? If I look at the Juno, right now I've got it set so that it's got a very fast attack. I've also got it set so that the release is very fast. So when I take my finger off, the release says, how quickly does the note fade out? So attack, how quickly does it fade in, if you want to think of it that way? And then release, how quickly does it fade out as soon as you take your finger off? Both of these are dependent on the finger. If I set the release longer, watch what happens. Note takes a while to fade out. If I set the attack longer, the sound fades in. If I set it really long, 
takes a long time. So that is what the envelope is doing with the attack and the release. Now let's talk about the decay and the sustain. So attack, we're talking about time. Decay, we're also gonna be talking about time. Decay gives you the ability to choose the sound to go to full volume at first and then to drop off to whatever the sustain level is. If I set the decay up as fast as it can go right here, what's gonna happen is it's going to very quickly drop down, after it reaches its full volume, it's gonna very quickly drop down to whatever the sustain level is at. So we've got time for attack, time for decay, sustain is a level control, volume control, and then release is a, a time value as well when the node is released. So decay only really matters if your sustain is somewhere below the full volume. So let's try this. Let's so we can see that the decay isn't doing anything because decay is just a time value before it hits the sustain level. So why would you want this? Well, what you could do is you could have a sound where the sustain level is lower than the maximum level that it first gets to at the attack and then the decay determines how quickly it drops down to the sustain level. So, so we can go whoa, 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 and then it gets to the note. Sustain level. And the sustain level just keeps going at that level until you release the key. And then we get the release value. So maybe let's crank up the release value. We can hear it releasing for longer. So you gotta really play with these controls to get your brain around them. So let's take the decay really fast again and a really, a really low sustain level. Now let's set the attack fast. So we got percussive sound, and then it drops really quickly to this quiet sustain level. Now let's take the decay and make it a little bit longer, and the sustain lower. Now let's make the decay faster. So you're really going quickly to that sustain level. And a little bit slower. Slower to that sustain level and even slower to that sustain level. Now let's make the attack longer and even longer. So we got the and then it comes down. Longer. And then the release when I take my finger off. Just gives you a way to shape the volume and we can get percussive sounds by having short attack and really fast decays. Let's look at Serum. I go over here, I can change the attack in Serum. Right here I can make it a longer attack. I've got a decay which I can make shorter or longer and I've got a sustain level which I can lower and it's really neat because in, in Serum you get this beautiful animation that shows you a little dot as to where you are in the envelope. Let's set my release nice and long and watch what happens. You're going to see a slow build up. It's going to drop off in the decay section and stay at this sustain point until I release the key. Start again. Up. Sustain point stays there until I release the key and then we see the release. Let's take the release down short. Let's turn the filter off actually. Now let's make the attack a lot shorter and we'll just crank it back right here. So it's just perfect to show you what's happening. And in, and in Serum here, we can make this a logarithmic attack or a linear attack if we want. Let's take this down. Let's take this and make the sustain level really low. Make the attack faster or really fast. Now, the thing about an envelope is it's a special kind of device called a modulator. And a modulator can change any parameter over time. But an envelope can also be used to control other aspects of sound.
And that's where something like this EG or envelope generator on the Korg can be applied to a different parameter on the Korg. Same thing in Serum, we have other envelopes that we can turn on. We have other envelopes in Massive X, in Omnisphere, all of these different devices. So let's look at the Korg and what we can do with an envelope generator to adjust the filter. So I'm going to play a note. I'm going to adjust the filter because we have to have the filter actually doing something to hear something here with this envelope generator. And then what I'm going to do is turn up the envelope generator intensity. And now what we can do is change the filter over time with those same ADSR controls that we were just controlling volume with. So watch what happens when I change the attack on this envelope. Let's change the resonance up a bit too. If I do the attack very quickly, the filter just kicks in quickly. It's not that exciting. If I set the attack longer, it's going to close off the filter over time and it's going to take longer. So there it's a short attack. Now it's taking longer to reduce those high frequencies. Longer. So that's how we can change the speed at which this filter kicks in on the note. Right now we've got a long attack and then we've got sustain. Well, what does sustain do on a filter? Sustain on a filter means as you have the note held down, where is the filter level going to be at? So if I have my decay set pretty fast, we hear the filter kicking in and then it's stopping at a fairly filtered state. If I have it raised up, it's going to stay at a wider uh, filter cutoff point. And here we're not really getting any change at all after it gets to the sustain level. But if we go really low, Now we can hear what the decay is doing. So watch what happens. Now if I change the decay time, remember decay is time. It takes longer. It's going to take even longer the more I drag it up to get to that sustain level. Let's set the, the decay really fast and the attack a little longer. So we're here, attack, decay, and then sustain. Longer attack. And then it gets to that quick decay, long attack, long decay, fast attack, long decay. So we can hear how the envelope generator is changing the characteristics of the filter. And it's using the same types of controls. We can do the same thing on the Juno. We can do the same thing on all of these different software synthesizers as well. Okay, so now let's go to the filter. And then let's change the sustain level on the filter so that it, it gets wide and then closes down. And let's take the sustain and make it even lower. And even lower. And the decay controls how fast does it take to get to that sustain level. That's instant, or almost instant. And now let's go longer. And then it's going to stay at that sustain level, which is quite closed off. If I change my cutoff even more, it's going to get more drastic with this control. Until it's cutting the fundamental frequency as well. Let's go a little bit higher. Let's set the decay faster. Set the attack a little bit longer. So, using the filter with an envelope generator can get you those wub wub sounds, it can get you all sorts of different characteristics of the filter frequencies as you hit each note, and it's going to change it over time. Another type of modulator that we have in most synthesizers is something called the LFO, or the Low Frequency Oscillator. So this is the last component of the synthesizer that we'll talk about in this video, and the LFO, you can think of it kind of like this thing that just causes fluctuations in any parameter, almost, depending on the synthesizer. 
So if I look at the Juno, we have this LFO, and what it can do is it can cause fluctuations that repeat over time on certain parameters. Let's try modulating or changing over time the pitch. So I go to the oscillator section of the Juno here, which generates the pitch, and I can start turning up this LFO control. And if I do that, it's going to create this thing that pulls, that modulates over time, oscillates, or fluctuates the pitch. And so the more I turn up this LFO, the more fluctuations in pitch I'm going to have. Sounds kind of like a siren. Well, what, what do you think is going to happen if I go to the LFO and change the rate of the LFO and push it up? Crank all the way up. So that's how we use the LFO to control the pitch. It's a frequency that's going up and down a certain amount of times per second. It's a very long frequency. That's why they call it a low frequency oscillator. It has nothing to do with notes. It has everything to do with just a frequency of change. That's what the LFO is. So what else can I use the LFO for? Well, if I go to my filter, wouldn't it be neat if I could alter the frequency like that? Especially with the resonance turned up. Well, of course I can if I turn up the LFO on the filter section. So now, as I change the rate of my LFO, I get longer or faster changes. And so you can get things like uh, vibrato. You can get vibrato with, with the oscillator. I can, I can sort of emulate vibrato on this synthesizer sound by turning the LFO up on the pitch section. So we can do the same thing on other devices. We've got the Korg over here and it has an LFO section and we can even choose the type of wave of the LFO on the Korg. So if I play a note on the Korg here, I can then choose the LFO rate and I can choose what it's controlling. I want it to hit the pitch. I want it to change the oscillator pitch. So I'm going to choose the wave. Let's start with a square wave. And then all I have to do is turn up the intensity. So I crank up the intensity. And we can hear it's going farther and farther in pitch. Now this is a perfect example of what an LFO is doing in the sense that it's modulating with a wave. And if I use a square wave, you can hear it at the high note and then instantly down at the low note. And then at the high note and then instantly down at the low note. Change the rate. Now the oscillations are happening slower. You know, every couple seconds kind of thing. I can change it to a triangle wave. Let's see what that sounds like. Change the rate. Change the intensity. Now let's go to a sawtooth wave. So we can hear it dropping off, jumping straight up. That's the sawtooth wave. As we see it in this little picture, it jumps straight up and drops down gradually. We can also take the LFO on the Korg and, and apply it to the filter. So now it's on a, on a sawtooth wave. So we get full filter open and then it drops off. Full filter open and then it drops off. Whereas the square would be full filter open, full filter off. Full filter open all the way. And then triangle, more gradual, up, down, up, down. It's like taking the filter control Let's take the intensity right off and doing this. That's exactly what an LFO is doing, is it taking some parameter for you and then moving that knob over and over and over again. And you get to choose how fast it's moving that knob and you get to choose the intensity that it's moving that knob. So LFOs are a really neat way to add shape to your sounds without having to go in and automate things. You can almost think about it like automation on these ancient devices or on the software as well. And the best thing about the software is you can have it sync to the tempo of your song. So your LFO can make these changes and have it sync to the tempo of the song so that 
all of these changes are in the beat, right? So if your wub, 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 wub is happening, it's happening with the beat. Sorry about all the wub, wubs. I don't know where that's coming from. All right, so I think that's probably good enough for the basics of synthesis for this video. I'm gonna have more videos about synthesis in the future. I may be talking about hardware synthesizers specifically, or I may be talking about the software synthesizers. But what this video does is it gives us a starting point to look at the different sections of the synthesizer and see how the software software is implementing all of these different components and what we can do to manipulate them. So hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for sticking around to the end. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell and we'll see you in the next video.